Yes, he is. He is in this place. Amen. Ah. Well, welcome. I'm Pastor Harold. Just show. <laughs> I wasn't Just. in the sun that long. <laughs> he said he wasn't in the sun that long. <laughs> That's pretty good. If you had been, then you would be like uh, Dr. Uh, some oh. some pebble, <laughs> a chocolate. Uh, <laughs> More caramel. <laughs> More caramel. <laughs> okay, so we ready yeah. for the word? Yeah. yeah. So let's jump in. Of course, we're going to continue Pastor Harold's series, talking about Holy Ghost stories. And today he's charged me to talk about the Holy Spirit and how he operated in the Old Testament. But we're also going to connect it to the dilemma, or should I say the questions that Nicodemus had, mm -hmm. and why did he have them? And so let's start, go to John chapter 3, I'm going to read verses 1 through 12. Starting at verse 1, it says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, Unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who was born of the spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And so Nicodemus and the Lord are having this encounter. And so like I said, we're going to answer the question, why did Nicodemus struggle so much with what Jesus had to say? Then we're going to look at the different ways the Holy Spirit operated in the Old Testament, or moved. Operate is not really a good word. The way he moved in the Old Testament. Then we're going to return to Nicodemus and examine who he was and how that played in a part and why he was so confused. And we're going to also look at what he possibly missed in the scriptures that he was supposed to be an expert in. So let's look at Nicodemus first, his struggle, as we see by the questions he asked in verse 4 and verse 9. Verse 4, he said, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? That last question lets us know how confused he really is as if such a thing were possible. And then look at verse 9. He, after Jesus explaining how you're to enter into the kingdom of God, he's like, how can these things be? I mean, when you read that, you can sense the exasperation in his voice. He's really struggling with what Jesus has just said. So what is his background? He was a Pharisee, which means he was a revered teacher in Israel. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, which meant he was a ruler in Israel. They came to him on matters of the law. Both of these titles meant that he was an expert in the Torah or the law of God. He assumed as a privileged Jew that he was already in the kingdom of God. He was just awaiting for the Messiah to come and set up his kingdom and that the Messiah would automatically honor who he is. I'm Nicodemus. Now, here's Jesus telling him that he must be born again to enter into the kingdom of God. 
Imagine you think you belong, that you're already in. And now Jesus shows up and tells you, no, you're not. So he was really confused. So let's look at some of the things that he should have known by how the Holy Spirit moves by going to the Old Testament. So let's go to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. It says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So we know the Holy Spirit was present at the beginning of creation. And it says here that he was hovering over the waters. Some Bibles might say fluttering. It's almost like how many have watched drag races? And you know, before they actually take off, they rev their engines, letting you know we are ready to take off. Well, it's like the Holy Spirit was waiting for the Father to speak so that he could go into action. So we know he was present at the beginning. Go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. In verse 7 it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Pastor described last week, one of the names for the Holy Spirit is the breath of God. And so we believe that when God breathed into him, that was actually the action of the Holy Spirit, and boom, it jump-started, it kick-started life. In Adam. Go to Exodus chapter 35. Exodus 35. I'm going to start at verse 30. God has brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. And he's taking them on to the promised land. But he's giving them instructions on how to worship him. He's giving them instructions on the tabernacle that they are to build. And so let's look at verse 30. It says, And Moses said to the children of Israel, See, the Lord has called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Ur, of the tribe of Judah. And he was filled with... And he, he has filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom and understanding and knowledge in all manner of workmanship to design artistic works to work in gold and silver and bronze in cutting jewels for setting in carving wood and to work in all manner of artistic workmanship. And he has put in his heart the ability to teach in him and Aholiab, the son of Ahissamach of the tribe of Dan. He has filled them with skill to do all manner of work of the engraver and the designer and the tapestry maker in blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine linen, and of the weaver, those who do every work and those who design artistic works. And Bezalel and Aholiab and every gifted artisan in whom the Lord has put wisdom and understanding to know how to do all the manner of work for the service of the sanctuary shall do according to all that the Lord has commanded. So it's the Spirit of God who filled certain individuals with the skill, the knowledge, the understanding to design the works of the tabernacle. And they had, and the Spirit of God had to do that because God had instructed Moses that all of these things were to be done to the detail as the pattern was given to Moses by God. So they needed special skill. They needed special help to carry this out. Go to Judges chapter 16. Judges 16. Now this is kind of an interesting story here. We're going to start at verse 16, and this is the story of Samson, who from the womb 
was vowed to be a Nazarite. And there are things that went with being a Nazarite, specially dedicated or consecrated unto God. And they were not allowed to cut their hair. And so let's look at verse 16. Well, let's give a little bit more background. Samson was a judge in Israel. And he was raised up not only to judge or lead Israel, but God had raised him up as a person that would also bring judgment upon the Philistines, who were the arch enemies of Israel. Well, the Philistines were very aware of Samson, his reputation, and his power. But they wanted to know the secret. And so they sent a person named Delilah because even though Samson was dedicated unto God, he had a weakness. He had a weakness. And his weakness was women. Tell you, can't live with him, can't live without him. And so Delilah was one that he really delighted in. And so the Philistines sent Delilah to try to find out what is the secret to his power, to his strength. And so let's take it up at verse 16. Let's see. After doing several, you know, inquiries, asking him, begging him, he teased her by misleading her and, and lying to her about what the secret was. And so he, she comes to him again in verse 16, and it says, And it came to pass, when she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him, so that his soul was vexed to death, that he told her all his heart and said to her, No razor has ever come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me, and I shall, become, I shall become weak and be like any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up once more, for he has told me all his heart. So the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in, her hand, in their hand. Then she lulled him to sleep on her knees and called for a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him, and strength left him. And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know the Lord had departed from him. Then the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze fetters, and he became a grinder in the prison. However, the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaven. So because he had this vow, but he told the secret, when they cut off his hair, the Holy Spirit left him. But notice it says his hair began to grow back. Functioning under that vow, as long as he was obedient to that vow, then the Holy Spirit came upon him. And if you read further, of course, Samson had one last wish, or request, actually. It says, will the Spirit allow him to judge or bring judgment upon the Philistines? And he stands between two pillars, knocks down two pillars, and destroys all of the Philistines. But he did that because the Holy Spirit was upon him. Here is the thing to keep in mind. The thing is, is that the Spirit coming upon someone in the Old Testament was temporary. It was not permanent. Under the Old Covenant, the bloodshed from the sacrifices given only covered our sins. They did not take them away. But we know we have a better covenant. Amen. We're going to get into that a little bit later. But now I want to contrast the Spirit of God coming on men in the Old Testament and how it prophesies what will happen when it comes upon Jesus. Go to Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah 
Isaiah 61. I'm going to read verses 1 in part of 2. It says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And I'm going to stop right there. And the reason why I'm going to stop right there. Because that's where Jesus stopped. Go with me to Luke 4. Luke chapter 4. Jesus has just come through. Being tempted of the devil and defeating him. And after that, he begins his ministry in Galilee, and then he goes to Nazareth. Look at verse 16. It says, so he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Amen. Now, of course, they reacted to him like, okay, isn't this Mary's son? Isn't this Joseph's son? And he's speaking as if that is him in the scriptures. Well, of course, we know it was him. Amen. But see, there was a difference between the Holy Spirit coming upon men under the Old Testament and the Holy Spirit coming upon Jesus. Go to John chapter 3, verse 34. John the Baptist is talking about Jesus. Speaking of Jesus, this is where he points out that he's not the Christ, but he was sent before him. That Jesus actually is the bridegroom, and he's just the friend of the bridegroom. He goes on to describe in verse 34, For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God does not give the Spirit by measure. Now, what does that mean? The men who received the Holy Spirit under the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, where he came upon them temporarily, only received, if, I don't even know if this is the right way to say it, but only received a portion, if you will. But when the Spirit of God came upon Jesus to minister, it says it was given to him, some Bibles say without measure. Other Bibles might say without limit. Without limit. That was the difference. Why? Because Jesus, of course, the Messiah, the son of the living God. So these are things that Nicodemus, as a Pharisee, as a teacher in Israel, was familiar with. So in light of what we've discussed so far, what is it that Nicodemus and many other Pharisees missed that point to the very things that Jesus is saying to him in John chapter 3. Go to Jeremiah chapter 31. What we're going to see here is why it's so important, and Pastor has already pointed this out, talking about understanding the whole counsel of God. 
Obviously, the Pharisees did not understand the whole counsel of God. Jeremiah 31, we're going to start at verse 31. It says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their mind and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Amen. So he says, I will put my law in their minds, and I will write it on their hearts. That sounds like a work that happens on the inside. I, I hope you know where I'm going with this. But just in case you don't, go to Ezekiel chapter 36. <laughs> Ezekiel 36. Starting at verse 16. It starts kind of rough. But it ends good. It says, moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, came to Ezekiel, saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own ways and deeds. To me, their way was like the uncleanness of a woman in her customary impurity. God did not spare words. <laughs> Therefore, I poured out my fury on them for the blood that they had shed on the land and for their idols with which they had defiled it. So I scattered them among the nations, and they were dispersed throughout the countries. I judged them according to their ways and their deeds. When they came to the nations, wherever they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said of them, these are the people of the Lord, and yet they have gone out of his land. But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations, wherever they went. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. And I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst, and the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I am hallowed in you before their eyes. For I will take from you, or should I say, I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all countries, and bring you into your own land. Now here's where it gets good. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people and I will be your God. Let's go back to verse 26. It says, I will give you a new heart. And I will put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you. That kind of sounds like being born again, doesn't it? So how is it that Nicodemus, a teacher in Israel, a Pharisee, a member of the Sanhedrin, how is it that he missed? what had already been prophesied. Let's talk about that. Amen. Tell you a little bit of the history of the nation of Israel. After Israel entered the promised land, they eventually rebelled against God and fell into idolatry. This led to God's judgment against the nation, which resulted in Israel's destruction and captivity in Assyria and in Babylon. 
When Israel came back into the land, they were determined to never fall into idolatry again. Teaching developed, though, that when Moses went up to receive God's law, which we know as the Torah or the first five books of the Old Testament, they believed that he also received a set of oral traditions or laws as well as that as well that were passed down by word of mouth. So in other words, we've all seen the Ten Commandments. Moses came down with the tablets and the Ten Commandments and other teachings of God. Well, they also believed that he received other oral teachings that he did not record, but they were passed down from generation to generation. These teachings were eventually compiled into a system of traditions that became equal to the actual word of God in their minds and in their practices. Now remember, God had given strict warning, do not add to my word, nor take away. These teachings, these systems of traditions became what many called a fence around the Torah or the law. Which, if they followed, it protected the law from being violated. Let me do an illustration. Let's say this podium up here. Pastor Harold has declared that no one from this point forward is to touch this podium. And to ensure that no one ever touches this podium again, he builds or has some people build a wall around it. <laughs> to ensure that no one will mistakenly violate the podium. Now I know that sounds ridiculous. But that is exactly what they did concerning the law of God. They thought that by building this fence around the law somehow made them more holy, more righteous. And so because of that, they went from depending on God to depending on themselves and their own Let's look at how Jesus addressed this. Go to Matthew chapter 15. We're going to read verses 1 through 9. It says, Then the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem, came to Jesus, saying, Why do your disciples transgress the traditions of the elders? Now listen to that question. Why do they transgress the traditions of the elders? They, don't trans they didn't ask, did why do they transgress the law? They were more concerned about their traditions. <laughs> but they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. He answered and said to them, why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your traditions? Man, talk about throwing something back in your face. In other words, Jesus was saying, back up. Jump back. For God commanded, saying, honor your father and your mother. And he who curses his father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say... Whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God, that he need not honor his father or mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Go to Matthew 23. The reason why this is so important for us to understand today is we can get caught up in our own traditions and miss the move of God. 
Matthew 23, verse 1. Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. In other words, honor the authority that God has given them. But do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. But they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. So in other words, they lived as do as I say, not as I do. Jesus said, avoid that. This is why Paul says this of them. Go to Romans chapter 10. Because Paul had to address these things. Romans chapter 10. We're going to read verses 1 through 4. It says, brethren, now Paul is speaking concerning the children of Israel. And his heart goes out to them. He says, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. See, they didn't understand that the law was given not to give them righteousness. The law was actually given when you study the book of Galatians to point out their sin. And their need for a savior. That's why the law was given. Because Paul says in another place, to those who walk according to the way God would have you, you don't even really need a law. If you walk according to the law of love, do I need to be told not to steal from you? Do I need to be told not to commit adultery or take another man's wife? So the law actually comes into play. It points out your problem. The Bible says it also serves as a schoolmaster or a taskmaster. It serves as a guard. It ser- I put it to some people before. It serves as a lighthouse so that when you stray, you know where to come back to. That's the purpose of the law. It was not given for you to attain righteousness. And that is what the Pharisees missed and therefore missed the move of the Spirit. And it's the reason why Nicodemus struggled. Because he's like, I'm a Pharisee. I'm a teacher in Israel. People come to me from all over for wisdom and understanding concerning the law. And now you're telling me I ain't even in? (laughs) That's why they, they opposed Jesus. He was a threat to everything that they stood for. But how many know God doesn't care about our traditions, our structures? He's here to save souls, win souls, deliver souls, heal souls, and bring them into the kingdom of God. That's what he's about. He could care less about how we feel. Thank God for that. So here's the bottom line. Jesus was exalting the importance and power of the spirit of God in enabling men to receive the kingdom of God. He was also pointing out to Nicodemus that there is no entrance into the kingdom of God apart from the work of the spirit of God. Just as man became a living soul in Genesis chapter 2 by the breath or spirit of God, man is made alive in the kingdom of God by the spirit of God, as stated in John chapter 3 verse 5. Under the old covenant, the spirit of God came upon men temporarily, while under the new covenant, he takes up residence within us permanently. Let me say that again. I don't think everybody heard that. (laughs) Under the old covenant, the spirit of God came upon men temporarily, while under the new covenant, he takes up residence in you permanently. All right.
We praise God because he has brought us in under a better covenant with greater promises by way of the plan of God the Father, the cross of God the Son, and the power of God the Spirit. Amen. Stand to your feet. I know some of y'all said, man, he ain't in quick. We have a better covenant with better promises, greater promises. We serve a God that not only saves us, but he's able to keep us. There was a song by the Winans some years ago. It says, it's good to know he'll be there whenever I fall. But it's better to know that I don't have to fall at all. Because he's able to keep me. Jude says, now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Father be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and forever. That's the God we serve. Give him praise. Give him praise. Give him praise. Praise him. But now I want to make my appeal to those who may be here who are asking, okay, I don't really understand what this is all about. because you're not a part of that covenant. But I want to let you know that Jesus died for you as well. That God sent his son to die for you. If you're here and you don't know that if you died tonight, if you would be able to stand before him without condemnation, I want to encourage you to come forward right now and receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. That's right. Altar ministry team, come on up. It's good to have a wife. <laughs> every head bowed, every eye closed. Again, if you're here and you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to give you this opportunity to receive a gift that keeps on giving. Not only will you receive eternal life, you will receive God's spirit on the inside. And he will dwell in you forever. There is one here. I want to encourage you to come right now. God is making his appeal through me to you right now. Now is the day of salvation, not tomorrow. Not next week, but now. I also want to appeal to those who you've given your life to Christ, but maybe you've walked away or you've strayed away. Well, like the prodigal son who returned home, God is that father whose arms are wide open waiting to receive you right now. And if that is you, I want you to come forward as well. And lastly, I want to make my appeal to those who just need prayer. You want to agree in prayer from a loved one for healing, for whatever you might need. I want to encourage you to come forward. We have people who will pray with you and agree with you in prayer and they know how to intercede before God. Come forward.
altars are open. song like way back and just recently it's got some people started playing the song again it's called Loved Him Back you know what I love about this family is that in a group this size there are going to be people that fall maybe that person standing right here. Yes. And I've fallen. It may have been yesterday. It could have been last night, you know? This is what I want you to hear this morning. That we don't point fingers. We don't condemn. We don't put down. We don't set ourselves up as judges and say, you've got to live up to my standard because our standard didn't high enough. We don't compare ourselves to one another because there's a lot of danger in that. Some of you are on your walk and you're here and some of you are here. We're on different levels of our walk. But here's what we do. When we see somebody fall, we reach down to pick them up. Amen. The name of the song is Love Them Back to the Lord. You don't curse somebody back to the Lord. You don't condemn somebody back to the Lord. You don't kick somebody back to the Lord. You pick them up and you love them. And so some of you may just be very guilty of pointing the fingers and calling people out. You know, I've heard it a long time ago when you're pointing the finger at somebody, you got like three pointing back at you. You're pointing your finger at somebody. So I want to invite you this morning to come and pray. Kneel at the altar, maybe. Maybe you're one of those you felt like, man, I've just been kicked down. I've been put down because I've fallen. We want you to come up here and we want to pray for you. Amen. If you, if you feel like you've just fallen off the grid or you've messed up and everybody thinks that you're a loser, I'm going to tell you you're not a loser. I'm gonna, we want to pray for you. So if that's you this morning, you've really struggled in your walk recently, you feel like you're not, you're not feeling the love that you should feel. I want to I wanna love on you this morning. This family wants to love on you this morning. So I want to invite you to come. Now, if you're one of those people that's pointing the fingers, you might need to come too and receive and repent for that so that you can be restored and be renewed. Amen. This is a family. How many of you, how many of you have a perfect family? Your own blood family is perfect. <laughs> I, say, I hear the laughter. I hope you're laughing about yourself. Yeah. Because you may be the one that hey, they think I'm the, I'm the whatever. <laughs> I'm the imperfect one. Yeah. So would, y'all, if, if, would you just be honest enough and say, man, I have not, I've messed up and I just need to be loved on. We'd love to pray for you this morning. Okay? Y'all just bow your heads real quick. Father, I, I pray for that one or the two or the hundred or this morning that maybe felt like they haven't arrived, they haven't lived up to some measure or standard. Or they just walked out and openly rebelled against you. Help them to know this morning, Lord, that they're still loved. You're still the God of forgiveness. You're the God of restoration. You're the God that heals. And we want to just love them, Lord. Help them to know more than anything that they are loved by you. In Jesus' name. There's still prayer going on, intercession. Altars are still open. Still open, they're still coming. Feel this place with your presence. Come, come and feel this place with your glory. Lord, it's no. Just 
still ministry going on. We're going to go ahead and praise God for you guys coming out on today. We just pray that you'll have a blessed week and many of you will see you on Wednesday. Some of you will see you on tomorrow. But wherever you go, make sure you take Jesus with you. God bless you guys.